Hello, everyone. Hi, happy weekend. Thank you all for joining us. We have Emily Austin here. Thank you so much for coming, Emily. Thanks for having me. All right, so I'm going to give an intro to all of these beautiful people while we wait for everyone else to join, and then we can dive into the questions. So Emily Austin is the author of our, uh, is it December? Yeah, our December fiction pick, Everyone in This Room Will Someday Be Dead. Um, Emily was born in St. Thomas, Ontario, Canada. Shout out to our Canadian Safleties, and she's now in Ottawa. She earned her BA in English Lit and Literature and Religious Studies at King's University College and her MA in Library and Information Science at Western University, okay, Dewey Decimal System. Um, she has a background in libraries, teaching, and working as an information architect. I love that term. Her debut novel, Everyone in This Room, was long listed for the Stephen Leacock Memorial Medal for Humor, a finalist for the Ottawa Book Awards, and shortlisted for the Amazon First Novel Award. And her second novel, Interesting facts about space and her first book of poetry, Gay Girl Prayers, are coming soon. I love that title. Um, thank you so much for being here again. Um, and congratulations on your debut novel. What has that publishing process been like for you? Well, thanks so much for having me. Um, it's been good. I've had a really, like, a really nice um, experience in terms of publishing. I feel a little guilty about it. It might be some, like, uh, Catholic guilt problems coming through, but uh, I feel I, I wrote like a novella before everyone in this room will someday be dead. So I had a little bit of experience with that in terms of like rejection. So I just want to preface talking about my publishing experience with that. So, you know, like I've definitely experienced rejection, but in terms of everyone in this room will someday be dead. It was like um, really pot, like I I finished writing it and and uh, like barely edited it even and tried to find uh, a literary agent. And I figured, cause I always assume the worst. So I figured like, I'll just like check some literary agents off my list and I won't like, it, nothing good will happen. But I ended up getting a literary agent right away. We went on submission and edited it right away. And it was like, it was so shockingly positive the entire way. And yeah, so bizarrely very good publishing experience <laughs> despite that's my expectations. <laughs> that's honestly amazing to hear because you know, that's not the norm, but I love that this book was just like sailed through so easily. It, just, it must have been lucky time or so, I don't know. I just found this lucky moment in time and everyone, all the right people. And yeah. I mean, we are in an unhinged girly era. Yes. So yes. it's <laughs> not the time, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and speaking of Catholic guilt, um, I am a religiously traumatized, anxious, queer girly like Gilda. Um, and was cackling throughout this entire novel. This is like my specific brand of dark humor to a T. Um, and I have to know, and you and I have talked a little about this, but can you talk about growing up Catholic, religious, and what your relationship with religion is now and how that's affected your um, gender, sexual identities, and in turn, Gilda's? Sure, yeah. So yeah, I was raised Catholic. Um, went to Catholic school my whole life and was raised in like a small conservative, heavily Catholic town. My mom's side of the family was more Protestant and sort of like evangelical Protestant. So I also had a window into that. Um, it definitely affected, I, I have that experience that I think a lot of queer people have where when you grow up, you look back and you realize all your friends were queer, um, even though we didn't know that we were, right? So and we went to Catholic school. And so I had this little pocket of friends that were all gay and didn't realize it. And some of us, not until like early twenties or, and some even later, I think. Um, but anyways, and, and we all were really affected by, you know, like the heteronormative, like the society, but also the Catholic ingredient to that definitely had a strange and negative impact on, uh, on our, you know, experience at school. Um, today, what was the other part of your question? I mean, I, I identify as an atheist today. Um, uh, and yeah, I think, did I answer? <laughs> was yeah. there a component to that I didn't answer? Yeah. How, how did your religious upbringing, you know, affect Gilda's right, yeah. um, relationship to religion? Because, I mean, she's this atheist lesbian and knows nothing about the Catholic church and is just like thrown in the middle of it. So I'm curious how that influenced her character yeah. building. 
Yeah, so I thought with her, like before I started writing that book, I tried to think of, um, you know, I was trying to think of easy ways to write a book. And I was like, what are, what are some topics I can talk about? You know, I can talk about mental illness pretty easily without having to do too much effort. And I can talk about the Catholic Church because of my upbringing. And I thought about, I was thinking a lot about sort of what we were just saying, like in terms of what it's like to be queer and Catholic. And I thought how, um, and I was also having sort of those like existential thoughts of how strange it is that we exist and, you know, we're animals on this planet. And then when you put in the religious aspect to thinking that way, it's even weirder. And, uh, and so I was trying to imagine what it would be like to be someone who wasn't who didn't have that growing up, who didn't like, who didn't have the sort of uh, like illusion of certain things growing up and didn't, didn't know, um, sort of, like could sort of tell how strange it is. Um, and I also was having like the thoughts of how bizarre things are. And it was easier to emphasize how bizarre that is with a character who isn't, um, who wasn't raised Catholic or religious necessarily. And uh, yeah, so that's that's how I that's how I yeah. can her. Because yeah. it's all so normal that like, oh, you're literally eating the body and blood of Christ. <laughs> and then when an outsider walks in, they're like, what the fuck are all these cannibals? cannibals. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's so weird. And you know, took me and is still taking me like, oh, that's really weird that that is something that people actually believe. Yeah. Um no, I love that. And I also noticed that you based the chapters of this book um, on moments in the Christian calendar. You have Advent, Twelve Tide, Ordinary Time, Lent, and Easter. Um, what made you make that creative choice? I thought that was sort of, um, I thought it was a fun way to structure it, like time-wise in one way, but also just to, you know, thematically. Um, when I was writing the book, I was, I was like examining a lot of my religious beliefs and sort of digging into like how the Catholic church works. And, and I was, I think I just had like a fixation on certain things like, um, like the, the uh, calendar, like the Catholic calendar and, and uh, yeah, so I was just trying to tie that in, but yeah. yeah. Um, so on the surface, some of Gilda's thoughts and tendencies venture into the absurd, but this is one of the most relatable depictions of anxiety and depression that I've read of read as of late. And the more I got to know Gilda, the more I fortunately and unfortunately started to identify with her. Um, what was important for you to convey as you built her character out and what was difficult writing about? Um, what was difficult to write about her? Were you worried of how readers would perceive her? You know, I wasn't worried about how, re I, I, I never really thought about anyone reading her. Like I, um, obviously like I pursued the book getting published and stuff, but I always assumed the worst. And so I didn't, I never even entertained that anyone else would read this book. So I don't think that featured too much into how I wrote her. I, I did want to, like, I wanted to see how well I could represent what it feels like to be like an anxious, depressed person. Um, and to see if I could really like communicate that, particularly to someone um, who isn't, who doesn't feel that way. Mm -hmm. um, so that's part of what I was trying to do. I was trying to really like, uh, like see how much I could, I could convey what it feels like to be depressed and anxious. I had just started like therapy when I started writing that book. And I think part of what I was trying to do just like selfishly for myself was to see um, if I could communicate certain thoughts and feelings I had because I found myself in therapy and I'm, I'm not as uh, uh, like, I can't speak as, as, I can't be as clear when I'm speaking as I can when I'm writing. So I think part of it was like, sort of like an exercise for myself to be like, okay, when I'm talking to my therapist and I'm trying to say like, this is a certain problem I have, how can I convey that? Cause I found myself in, in my like therapy sessions being like, I don't know what to say, like, I, uh, and not being able to communicate. So I think part of it was that part of it was me trying to see like, how can I communicate this particular ex experience? Um, and yeah, that's, that's what I was trying to do with Gilda, I think. Um, has your therapist read your book? 
I, I, I stopped working with that therapist to me. And I, I, I never mentioned that. I, I probably should. That doesn't reflect well on me in terms of my uh, therapy. I should probably stay, but no, I've never, I've, I don't want them to. <laughs> That's <laughs> very <know>. fair. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, that makes sense that you feel more eloquent writing than you do speaking because I feel the exact same. Oh, my buzzer is going off. One second. <laughs> living in New York problems um one at your door was it your alarm yeah I don't know I just opened it we're, <laughs> we're being interested. I'm sure it's like a package of no, something no because um, <laughs> no, I feel the same way and I journal every single day um and writing out my feelings gets me to the root of what it was did you feel that like I mean I guess the question here is like how much of you do you see in Gilda or how much of Gilda do you see in you did you feel like there was like a therapeutic process in writing this novel yeah so there definitely is like you know um like in the Venn diagram of Gilda and me there's obviously some overlap but are we, we not exactly the same definitely and uh like sometimes I sometimes I get messages from people that I can tell they think I am Gilda mm -hmm. And I think that's something that just happens when you're a writer and it's, but it's a little funny. Like I've gotten one before that was like, oh, I thought your Instagram was just a picture of like a cat you saw once or something. Cause that says that in the book somewhere that Gilda, I'm like, that's not, this isn't, a, this isn't my life story. Like I, I didn't work at a Catholic church. I'm not, you know, um, but there definitely is some overlap. Um, I think there are parts of this book that definitely are my own like attempts at like communicating my own like I would have a lot of the same mental health problems that Gilda has mm -hmm. but there are also um significant parts of her that I don't think I am at all um I think uh yeah so you know there's a blurry line there but yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that makes sense. yeah. um and as kind of mentioned earlier, this novel is part of this kind of current moment, larger trend of unreliable, classically unlikable, severely mentally ill, unhinged female narrators, which is my bread and butter. Um, and makes the reading experience a bit of a trip because you don't know what to believe or, you know, what is the truth. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen this book compared a lot to My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Otessa Moshfe. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about that comparison and how divisive these characters can be? Um, well, I like that book. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, I think they're, I like, I would think of Gilda as being not as much of a bad person <laughs> as potentially the the main character of my year of rest and relaxation but i i uh i appreciate that people would like those the that the same readers might like those books i think that's a compliment um and i think something i was trying to do with this book though is um and i don't know if i did it successfully but i was trying to sort of um create the impression that maybe gilda was um like I wanted people to question a little bit, like, is she, is she the person who's doing, like, is she bad? Is this, um, and I wanted intentionally for her not to be, um, there's some books that will, um, there's some books that sort of make it so that the main character is like crazy in a way that makes them bad. And in a way that, um, like has, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but there's sort of a moral to that that I don't like. Uh, that's like, you know, um, unhinged women with mental illness are dangerous necessarily or bad people or, um, you know, that kind of thing. And I didn't want that to be, I didn't want that to be the case, at least in this book for this particular case. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like Gilda is too pure hearted and people pleasing to ever be like she would rather saw her own arm off than make anyone <laughs> exactly. yeah, yeah. um like she is she, 
she's like self-martyring constantly. Exactly. Yeah. Ooh. And that's not good either, but yeah. Is, yeah. Not good. Yeah. Um, but I just literally cannot imagine her like co- intentionally causing harm to another person unintentionally. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> um, but what did you, as her creator, what did you want readers to empathize with her? Because I think that, you know, they're, I swear to God, New York is so much fun. I'm sorry, I'll be right back. I can't hear it when it happens. I don't know if anyone else can. <laughs> I think Zoom like mutes it. Okay, back to the question. Um, <laughs> so Gilda is like when you're reading this book, often you feel intense cringe secondhand embarrassment or you're just like oh my gosh if you make a different decision things would be better like you're rooting for her but you're kind of just like get yourself together (laughs) and then other times you're like oh my god I've been in this place it really depends on the reader I think and what did you want readers to empathize with her about I want to, you know, when I'm reading, I, I like, um, and I, th- I appreciate people read things differently and for different reasons, but I like to f- like understand what it's like to be in someone else's shoes when I'm reading. Like I want to, I want, I think it's like a way of developing empathy and I find it like, um, like particularly I appreciate reading books um, with people who I don't completely identify with Mm -hmm. because it helps me understand how they operate in the world, for example, and, um, you know, gives me more empathy. And so I guess like truthfully, I didn't really imagine um, people reading this book, but I, in retrospect, what I would want is to is for people to understand what it might be like, for example, to be someone who is like severely depressed and anxious and to understand um, like why they operate the way they do. I I have found times where people um, are like baffled by other people's behavior because they don't understand that they are experiencing the world differently and that they're trying to, um, you know, like maybe they're trying to be polite in some strange way that you don't understand, or maybe they're trying to protect themselves in a way that you don't understand, or um, they've had certain experiences that make them behave in a way that to someone who doesn't, who hasn't had that experience might be like, oh, you're, you're crazy, or you're rude, or you're dangerous, or you're all these things. And I guess, yeah, like I was trying to show how, um, you know, someone might lie for a reason that maybe it still isn't good, but that you could at least understand why is this person lying? Why is this person, um, you know, like, for example, the way that Gilda behaves in her relationship with Eleanor, I was trying to show that she's, she doesn't behave well in that relationship. Like she's not, um, if Eleanor were my friend and she told me how her, how the person she was seeing was acting, I'd probably be like, I don't, I don't, I think you deserve better than that. Um, But nonetheless, I still would say, like, I would still appreciate knowing why people act that way. And I think, particularly with Gilda, like depression and anxiety, it's not acceptable, but can make you like a shitty person in relationships, for example. Um, So that's part of, I think, just having empathy for what it's like to be, um, to have sort of the mental illness that that Gilda has. Yeah. And you've said that you wrote this book kind of not thinking about the reader in mind, which I really love. Um, But now you have these two upcoming projects and I feel like you have to have the reader in mind because (laughs) of how successful everyone in this room was. Um, How has that, how has your writing process changed between writing for just the project versus writing for, you know, like a book deal? That's a good question. That's been, that's been really difficult for me, actually. Like, um, there's sort of like this, um, there are good and bad things, but before I felt really like I could write anything and I don't care. Like, I really don't, like, I, I never, I wanted it to be published and I wanted that, but I, it was always sort of like, like a pipe dream or like, I never really thought someone would read it. So now when I'm writing it, I'm like, well, I know at least my literary agent's going to read it. And like some editor's going to read it, like at a minimum, um, even if this doesn't get published, someone's going to read it. And it does make me um, more likely to like, um, 
I think it makes me a little like it, I feel a little more concerned <laughs> and thinking a little bit more about, about things that um, I also feel sort of like, I want to make sure that I'm like before I'm, I never really thought about things like, Oh, am I, is this the best possible thing I could put in the world? Like, what is the, what is the night, you know, you're putting a little, you're throwing something into the world. And now I'm like, Oh God, is this something that really should be thrown into the world? I want to make sure. But thankfully there's a lot of people involved when you publish a book who help with that. So I've been trying to also sort of lean into the niceness of that. Um, for, so for example, with my, with uh, interesting facts about space, Normally when I'm writing something, I feel like it has to be so perfect before I would ever let anyone else even look at it or I even mention that I wrote it. But with that book, when I finished writing it, I felt like, okay, this is like maybe like 70% okay. But I knew that I was going to have my literary agent read it and give me notes and edit it. And I knew that there's going to be an editor who comes in, who reads it and edits it. And there's sort of something freeing to that because I take it takes the pressure off you to make it perfect because you think, you know, I trust that these people can help me make it better. And that's been really nice. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're you kind of have that like safety net built exactly. in. It's like oh, I have these people that I can work on this with and kind of bounce ideas off of. Exactly. Compared to like what you turned in with everyone in this room, how how much change went into the book when you presented it the first time to what was published now? Yeah, so it definitely, um, it's the same story and the characters are the same, but there's certain things like, um, the one thing that I remember the most is that, um, I'm not great at writing like a romantic relationship, which is a little funny because in um, interesting facts about space, there's a lot of that. But um, so in everyone in this room will someday be dead. I sort of, with the relationship with Eleanor, I heavily suggested things like that they love each other, for example, but I would never have written anything that like um, really said that. And even now I think it's still pretty light, but through the editing process, I was asked to write a lot more about that relationship, for example. Um, that was a lot of, a lot of what happens in the editing process is people um, they guide you to do it or at least it's my, who, what do I know but this has been my experience they they'll say like well um, like what is they'll ask you a question about a certain character for example and be like well like I'm interested in knowing why they did this like what were they thinking what what happened to them that made them do this like um, why is this relationship the way it is? And, and they sort of like nudge you to write more about certain things. That's what it was like for me more. I'm more, I think other writers, it depends on who you are. I know sometimes it's like taking things out. For me, it was a lot more putting things in. Um, so with everyone in this room, there was a lot more of the Eleanor relationship. Um, what else? That was, that was a lot of it, like sort of explaining, um, some background information a little bit more, but it's definitely the same book. And yeah. uh, and the same is true with the next one. There's, it's definitely the same book, but I build out, I tend to be, maybe I should just do this myself, like <laughs> think of the, uh, build out the relationships a little bit more, but that's, that tends to be what I'm asked to do. So. Yeah. Speaking of Eleanor, um, you were right. She, I mean, Gilda really does not treat her very well, um, very, on and off very like full on and then complete ghost um but she keeps coming back um why <laughs> why does she do that I mean we don't really learn too too much about her other than she really shows Gilda that she has the capacity to love which is you know such a beautiful thing to read um but I'd love to know what you imagine for Eleanor um and that kind of like motivation to be with Gilda and you know, what do you see for them after the ending, if you've thought of it at all? Yeah. So I think, like I said, like if Eleanor were my friend, I probably would say you, you probably shouldn't be, you probably shouldn't be dating Gilda. But that said, I definitely, not to expose my friends, but I definitely have friends who have remained in relationships um, yeah. or they shouldn't have. So yeah. I do sort of see that as a, as a bit of a, maybe something that Eleanor should work on in herself. But I, I think, um, I imagine that they, um, that she saw a bit of Gilda and that they clicked and that despite the reality that she probably shouldn't have uh, kept dating someone who didn't treat her well, she was the type of person who would, which yeah. you know, some people are. We love being attached to the potential of a person rather yeah. than the actions that they show us. Exactly. I'm not speaking from personal experience <laughs> at all. Yeah. 
Um, and then her other sort of like romantic interest in the book is Giuseppe. Oh, yes. <laughs> I, this was the part where I was like so cringe, but also cracking up. It was so awkward. And I just like the lengths that Gilda went to, to not reject this person are so funny. Um, but then also him as a person, we all know a guy like that, like that very full of himself, like just wants to hear himself talk, um, toxic, positive, normie like no <laughs> mental illness in sight yeah <laughs> can't relate um the contrast between how he took up space and how Gilda took up space was really sad but really fun to read um and I'd love to know more about his motivations behind still dating Gilda because she was really giving him nothing was it just like Catholicism or <laughs> like him just wanting to find someone who would let him talk because I'm sure Gilda was the only person who would let him do that yeah I did sort of imagine him as someone who probably would have dated anyone because he's not really looking for a genuine connection with someone and is more so looking for someone who he can you know talk at and <laughs> uh yeah. yeah and I was trying to contrast like the the experience and I sort of was trying to do that with the character Barney too like the the experience of like um how some people operate in the world and how some people operate in the world and I was trying to show what it's like to be someone who um like there's something like she says Gilda says something about like laboring to produce appeasing facial expressions while Barney says things that are like flippantly insulting and not even realizing it um and I was trying to show like how certain people operate in the world with that sort of ease and they don't have the burden of thinking like how am I being perceived am I hurting anyone's feelings am I being polite am I um safe right now is this am I going to bother this person and some people are just like barreling through and they get to have um like a lot a lot more of an easy experience I think and they also have sometimes have no concept of what other people like Gilda, for example, what they're dealing with. So yeah, I was trying to I was trying to use Giuseppe and Barney to an extent to show to show that, um, and that sort of leans a little bit into the idea that I was trying to show. Um, I was trying to think of like. Um, you know, what it's like to be in someone's shoes, what it's like to be someone who's mentally ill and to show how some people, you know, I've been with people, for example, who like family members who notice someone behaving in a way that I'm like, oh, I understand why they're behaving like that. It's because they have, they're, 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 they have some mental illness or something. And they're like, why are they doing that? And, it, and they have literally no idea. Um, anyways, yeah. So I was just trying to compare that sort of experience in life. Yeah. And you know, kind of hearing about how other people, you know, don't have that kind of like empathy gene where it's like, oh, why is this person acting that way instead of, but their first thought is like, this is bad. Why are they doing it rather than, you know, under trying to understand the motivation. And that is Gilda's parents to a T. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're probably a perfect example of what not to do when you have a mentally ill child, which is, um, you know, vilify um, mental illness, gossip about it when it's, you know, about other people, whether it's like the crazy neighbor or parent, whatever, whoever they may choose to vilify that week. Um, but internally, it's all like swept under the rug. Um, this is unfortunately like still really common. Um, and it's so clear that it profoundly influences Gilda and her brother Eli in how they move through the world and how they talk to themselves. Um, yeah, I just, I think that this was a turning point, watching Eli descend into like deeper, what seemed like depression and addiction slash alcoholism. Gilda watching that was such a turning point for her in the novel of how to you know, take action against her parents in a way. Um, how do you see her relationship with her parents like affecting her storyline? And I mean, what do you think this character would be like if her parents were different? Yeah. So I was trying to um, show like 
a little bit of like the generational difference between I imagine boomers and someone of Gilda's age. Um, and I think there is like a common, obviously not all, the don't want to just boomer hate, but it's not all boomers, but, um, they, you know, there's a, there's a problem of, of most, or, you know, a generational problem of not acknowledging mental illness, of thinking of mental illness in a particular way of, um, you know, like, uh, therapy, for example, being something that they associate with like someone who is absolutely, you know, out of their mind and not uh, like embarrassing sort of. And I was trying to show how that attitude impacts um, other people. And I did imagine, for example, that Gilda's dad also had mental health problems and probably, you know, every, most people have mental health problems and, uh, but that he never faced them and that, that, um, has sort of a generational impact. And I think that, I think like, that's definitely my experience. And I think that's like a lot of people, um, you know, under, I don't know what age, but under maybe under 35, um, whose parents and older, I'm sure, whose parents uh, didn't think of mental illness as something that to talk about, thought of it as something that is like bad or embarrassing rather than, and there, I think there is a shift in younger generations, hopefully, and I, obviously there is, um, where we talk about it more and the stigmas changed and all that. Um, and yeah, I think if her parents had talked about it more, she'd be a lot better. She'd be, it, you know, like, it's just like any sort of illness. Like if you're, if you're, you know, if, if you openly talk about some like dermatology problem you have with your family, when you notice a weird rash on your arm, you're like, oh, I got this weird rash. Yeah. And the mom might be like, oh, I had that. And your dad had that. And, you know, here, this is what you do. You go, you go to the doctor and they give you this cream or you, whatever. Um, so if, if we did the same thing, you know, with our, with our mental illness, it would probably be similar where we would be able to pass on like advice and, and, uh, you know, openly talk about how to get better and things like that. So, yeah. yeah. And instead, Gilda just goes to the ER all the time thinking that she's lying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, kind of speaking of the ER, the ER and, you know, her scenes with Giuseppe and the emails to Rosemary, there was so much secondhand embarrassment that I felt reading this, which can be really, really fun, but also uncomfortable, of course. Yeah. What was that like? writing those scenes of secondhand embarrassment did you feel it you know I I'm the same as you were like if I'm I feel like I have to turn off shows when I'm like oh god like you know like I'm mortified and and I'll like cringe it but when you're the one writing it I had control over it so I didn't feel I'm like well you know <laughs> I can do this in my own contained way so I didn't feel that but I understand I understand what you mean <laughs> yeah um and I have a few more questions before we move to the rapid fire round, as I call it. Um, and for those who are on the call, if you have any questions for Emily, drop them in the chat box and we can ask them at the end. Um, and I want to talk about the ending of this book because I, I mean, I cry very easily. So I cried at the ending <laughs> of this. I mean, you have her phone calls to everyone from the jail cell. She we find out that Grace killed herself via assisted suicide. Then she meets Rosemary, who just said the sweetest things to her and really like reframed, I think, one of the core parts of this book, which is like, what if people wanted for you what you want for them? Um, and then she starts fixing her cabinets and puts her apartment back together. And then she fucking finds mittens and I lost it, but it was, it was just such a perfect sequence of events. And I personally love a happy ending where everything's kind of, it feels like really tied up in a bow. Um, did you know the book was going to end this way when you were writing it? Um, and why did you decide to have a happy ending for Gilda besides like she fucking deserved it after everything that she went through. Um, so I guess like the main question I was thinking of while I was writing that book is, um, you know, like I was thinking a lot about how everyone dies, obviously. And I was thinking a lot about how in every interaction, there's sort of this elephant in the room, which is that everyone's going to die. You know, every person I talk to, this is a conversation I'm having with someone who's going to die. I'm going to die. But worse, you know, like the people close to me are going to die. My friends are going to die. And how um, 
like disturbing that is and how like it's this like awful truth that's that we kind of like I think a lot of people operate in life by just ignoring and being like well that's I'm not going to even think about that but if you're someone like Gilda and this is where like like me I would say um I think of that like I often think when I'm talking to like a family member particularly family members that you only see a couple times a year like who knows what's going to happen to this person right like maybe this is going to be like a memory I have of this person when they die and um anyways and so I was trying to like the problem I was trying to like grapple with with this book is how do we uh keep living when that is so devastating and when it feels like and when you think like that a little too much it's hard not to think like what are we doing like this life is meaningless this is so depressing uh it's bizarre and like I'm in a horror movie like everyone's gonna die like this is horrible um and I think for me and I don't know if this works for everyone but for me the way out of that um and this is why I made um Grace's story the way it was is that it it's it doesn't have to be uh like everyone dying isn't necessarily a horror story it can also be sort of sweet it can also be kind of poetic it can kind of be like a nice thing if you really face it and so the way that Gilda was facing death in the beginning of the book is like I'm terrified this is horrible everything's awful this is I'm in a I'm in like this terrible bizarre uh horror movie and the way that Grace was facing it is like I had this beautiful life. I'm, I'm going to face it. It's not, it doesn't have to be this horrible, scary, terrible thing. It can be kind of in a way nice. Um, And so, and for me, that is how, like in my experiences with being depressed and like having that sort of like, you know, like suicidal type of thoughts, the way that I would have got got out of that is by thinking um, death isn't, isn't that bad. Like it's not, it doesn't have to be that bad. And that's what I was trying to represent in the book is this idea that, it, it, you know, someone like Grace's attitude is a better, is a nicer attitude and one that maybe I would try to get to. And like, if I'm lucky enough to be an old lady, I would hope that that would be the attitude that I would come to. Um, and that's what I was trying to do with the ending. And then in terms of uh, like Gilda, um, you know, like I was trying to show, I was trying to make like a, com- like a little comparison with Mittens, like Mittens, you know, whatever Mittens got up to in that time of missing is sort of like Gilda going through all this, all this shit and she's come out and she's still, she's still alive. She it didn't end with her, you know, with Mittens being dead or her killing herself or anything like that because she's uh, moving closer to that grace attitude. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God. I love that so much. Thank you for that answer. Um, is there a reaction from a reader that has stood out to you um, since you've published this book? You know, like, um, like I said, I really didn't expect people to read it. And so it has been really um, such a cool experience to hear from anybody who's read it. And um, it's sort of like, I've gotten a lot of messages from people who relate to Gilda and some of them have been like really personal messages. And that has been uh, really nice for me because I think uh, like a lot of those messages say things like, Oh, like it's made me realize that like, um, you know, like she's just like me and that kind of thing. Like, or like, you know, like, Oh, I have no original thoughts, that kind of, that kind of comment. (laughs) And uh And that to me has been so nice because I've, I get to feel the same way, like on the other end where I'm like, oh, like I, like, it's nice, particularly in terms of like mental illness to be like, oh, like other people feel this, this way too. And I'm not alone in the world. And, you know, this isn't some isolating experience. So on top of being like getting this, this cool feeling of like, oh, someone, someone related to this, I get to feel like I, I relate to so many people so it's been it's been a nice experience that's so nice I the messages that we got about this book in our Safflet community chat were like so so sweet and so many people identified with Gilda myself included so thank you for writing this book and making us feel seen as anxious queer girlies um, <laughs> But okay, so my last question, um, tell us about your upcoming work. What can you share with us? Sure. Uh, 
So let me say, interesting facts about space is about a, uh, a lesbian who has a phobia of bald men. And <laughs> it's, it's uh, sort of like, I, I should probably figure out how to talk about it better, but <laughs> it's like, uh, like figuring out why she has that phobia. Mm-hmm. Uh, she feels like someone's following her. And so that's sort of what's driving the story. But then uh, the other thing that's going on is that she's having her like first serious relationship with another woman. She's sort of just like a serial short-term dater before that. Um, so yeah, it's a story about uh, like sort of closeness with other people and, I don't know. I when I wrote everyone in this room will someday be dead. I mentioned in the editing process. I was told like, oh, write a little bit more about the Eleanor experience. And I like maybe I don't know. I want to like I wanted to force myself to write more about that because I found that difficult for me. I don't know why I would do that to myself, but I was like, okay, I'm gonna write something that's a lot more about a relationship. So it's heavily about um, like a, a romantic relationship between the, the main character whose name is Enid and. Uh, and this girl that she's seeing, so. I love that. Um, <laughs> I love the fear of bald men. I'm bad at that. Cannot wait to read that. Um, we'll definitely keep an eye out in Safflet for sure. Um, okay, rapid fire round. And I saw to those um, who are sending questions in the chat, um, select to everyone so that I can see them because um, a lot of them were going to Veronica. Um, thank you. And okay, rapid fire. What are you currently reading? Just read, I just read um, a book called The Adult, but it's not out yet, but it's a sapphic book. I, I don't know, I was asked to blurb it. It's called The Adult and it's by what's her, uh, Bronwyn Fisher is her name. I think it's a debut book, um, but it's really good. It's, it's about, it's like a coming of age story about someone in, in college, I think it might be, I don't know if it is, so I think it might be like a modern retelling of The Price of Salt, if you've ever read that. It's like a similar sort of- Love. <laughs> yeah, and it was sort of pitched as like a queer, um, normal people, I think. So anyways, yeah, so that, I just finished that. That was really good. Um, what else have I read recently? I only want to mention ones that I really like. So that's, let's say that. <laughs> um, do you have a book that you recommend everyone to read? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I have a problem where I always like, I'm like, well, is this person going to like this? And I would like, you know, say a different thing for everybody. Everybody like, um, like Frog and Toad are friends. <laughs> I've never met anyone who didn't like Frog and Toad. <laughs> I'm not. No, I love that. I've honestly, I've only read Frog and Toad from like online little. Oh yeah. But I've never held like that. So actual- funny and cute. Yeah, it's really good. <laughs> Queer culture. At oh its yeah. Time. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, did you take up an unusual quarantine activity? Oh, what did I do? You know what? No, I, I, I like didn't. I like stopped moving in any capacity like stopped walking I, I mostly like didn't take anything I rode a lot more but I don't think that's unusual um yeah, yeah no not really oil painting but I don't think that's unusual yeah. no, that, that, that cracks I mean for me it was like knitting like oh that's fun I yeah. should have done that, that it's, been. it's a fun thing to do while you're just like sitting like it's have you made anything I made a whole cardigan oh like, wow good for you that's cool that um cool. though I have a in because my mom is a knitwear designer and like pro knitter so I had a lot of help from her bless her soul um okay if you could have dinner with anyone dead or alive who would it be oh that's a fun question um you know there are a lot of like historical people and celebrities who I'm like deeply interested in but who like my truth is I don't ever want to talk to um (laughs) And like there have been a Wait, I have to know one one of those people now. That's I'm adding that <laughs> oh, as a no, I like every I don't know, like like Jesus, <laughs> the historical figure. Of, but I don't wanna, I don't know. I think I think um truthfully, I don't and like the first dinner that you have with anybody, that's never good. It's just awkward, right? Like I, 
maybe that's not how I'm supposed to interpret that question, but that's totally fine. Yeah. <laughs> so truthfully, truthfully, no. probably I probably decline. I wouldn't want to yeah. meet it. <laughs> that is so fair. Um, okay, favorite class that you took at university? Oh, favorite. Yeah, I took I took a thanatology class, which is the study of death and dying, and it was uh, it was a good class. I felt uh, I, I felt. Uh, a little enlightened by it. It was mostly like nurses in the class. It was just an elective for me. I was an English lit person. Um, so it was all like nurses who actually are going to have to deal with the reality of death and dying. But I was looking at it more in like a philosophical way. And I probably, I never really thought about it, but it probably helped me write that book. <laughs> I feel like that's like a book plot right there. Like someone who's taking a death and dying yeah, class. With I'll write it down, yeah. There you go. That's, yeah. that's for free. Um, and then favorite sapphic movie and or a TV show. Oh, that's fun too. Um, okay. I don't want to just think of the first ones that come to mind. I want to think of my actual ones. Um, I really like the favorite with Olivia Coleman and Rachel Weiss. I'll never seen it. Oh, that's good. That's the top of my list. <laughs> it's really good. I like Dairy Girls too. Wow. I think that's a good one. Um, it's not super sapphic and you know, this is a pretty well flea bag I, I like. Um, yeah, so good. Yeah. Um, and then sapphic celebrity favorite. Sapphic celebrity favorite. Oh, man. Um, like person to follow on social media. Okay. Um, you know, I love like a, I love like an old lady lesbian. Like I love a Holland Taylor or like a Miriam Margulies type of type of person so yeah I'll say yeah, I love that <laughs> okay saying. that concludes all of my questions so we're going to move to the chat and we have quite a few um oh this person doesn't have a name it just says iPhone but they said I keep thinking about how expensive all the ER visits would be I mean you're from Canada this That's is the thing yeah <laughs> an American yeah, I'm sorry, American girl. Yeah, like, yeah in Canada, um, you get to go to the ER all the yeah, time. Yeah, and how she it, probably it was able to pay for it and stressed me out. Oh, hi. I it thought. was my question. Sorry, <laughs> I don't have to. <laughs> I'm from Sweden, so it's for you here as well. Oh, but okay. I was yeah. thinking of uh, America. I was American, yeah. <laughs> I love I love I mean a yeah, people that, ask me that. Yeah, I should have. And it's funny because the book was published in America, but no one ever I think it would have been too much of a wrench to throw in the book to, to make it to make it American. Like, I never oh, she also it. has this mountain of medical bills. Yeah, oh God, yeah, it makes it off. so much worse. Oh. Yeah, it makes it so much worse. That's horrible. Um, and then she also asks, are we supposed to read Eli as trans? Because I definitely got those vibes while reading. I did as well. Yeah, like that's a good question. I think... Um, I think, to be honest, I wouldn't say 100% one way or the other. I think it's fair to read it that way. I think obviously Eli has like his gender non-conforming in some way, potentially trans, um, potentially just like questioning. Um, I sort of, of am of the mind that like the book is what it is and that when it's done, like I don't, like I personally, like for example, not to mention like a terrible person, but JK Rowling saying Dumbledore's gay, for example, <laughs> is like, yeah, well, he wasn't gay. Though. You didn't write it. Right. So I, I sort of am, am of the mind that if it's not there explicitly, then it's up for up for question. But I think it's totally fair to read Eli as trans. And in if if you wanted to know my opinion, you cared what the author's opinion was. I do see them as 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 that. But it's it's a gray. It's, it's gray. And yeah, you yeah. could you could feel that way. or not. Yeah. yeah. Um, speaking of Eli, Mary Rose asks, I would love to hear more about how you develop Gilda's relationship with Eli. I thought that they had such an authentic sibling relationship. Oh, thanks. Um, well, I have, I have, a, I'm one of four and part of what I was thinking about with this book is like, you know, how everyone's going to die. And, and I was thinking of my own siblings in that context and thinking of how like like I have a little brother for example and thinking of how like that's one of the worst uh you know like thought experiments it's like oh god like my sibling dying would be just like gutting and so that's part of I was I wanted a relationship like that in the book because I think that sort of emphasizes that how you know the the horrible reality of everyone dying um yeah, and that's how, and I was, I was, uh, with Eli, I also wanted to, to an extent, 
and I did this with Gilda too, and that like is to show what it's like to not only have, you know, mental illness, but to also have, you know, we all have like things on our shoulders, right? We all have, we're all carrying our, you know, all of our troubles. And some people have so many more troubles already on their back, right? And, um, and then when you add like, oh, also you're depressed, also you have this problem, also you have this problem and you start to, like you're weighed down a lot faster. And I was trying to show Eli as someone who already had some things on their back and, and how, um, you know, like having more uh, troubles in your life is even harder when you're already dealing with, uh, you know, burdens on, on your back. Yeah. Well, I love that answer. Um, Carmina asks, we all know the importance of book titles and covers, and this book wins in both those categories. What was the process of finding the perfect book title? And what is your favorite edition of the book cover? If you have one, I love that question. That is a fun question. Um, the title, the title, I like it when the title is, I like when I'm reading a book or like listening to a song and then I like read a line and I'm like, oh, that's from, I know, I get it now. Uh, so I was kind of, I'd wanted to pick a line from, from the book we had like, so with my agent, we had like a long list of possible titles. Mm -hmm. Um, so it came out that way. It came out as like picking out lines from the book and seeing which one would be potentially the best. Um, and, and I'm not great at that, to be honest, I don't have a good, uh, so thank you for saying that, but, um, I relied a lot on other people saying which one was, was, I was like, you, you tell me which one's the best because I have, I don't know. Um, and then in the covers, I feel really lucky that this book has a number of covers. There's a, like a UK cover, a UK paperback cover, an American cover and a, or a North American cover and a North American paperback cover. I think lately I like the, the North American paperback cover the best, which I don't have it on me, but it's, it has like a, a cute rabbit on it. And that's why I like it the best. I have the North American hardback with all the rabbits. Oh yeah, I like that one too. I love the dedication to flop, like really oh. made me. <laughs> um, okay, and then we have a question from Savannah. Having depression can honestly make life kind of boring sometimes. How do you balance writing a depressed slash sometimes unmotivated character and still keep the plot driving and engaging? Well, that's nice of you to say um, that it's driving and engaging. I don't know. Um, I think, um, I don't know. I, I, when I was writing this, I wrote other things at the same time. I do find like if you're writing like a super depressing, not that this is that depressing, but if you're writing like a depressing part of a book or you're writing a particularly depressing thing, it is like, like, <laughs> just like, oh, I don't know, I'm going to keep writing this. And it's not nice to make yourself like gloomy when you're writing. So I think it helps to write multiple things and for them to be a little different. And even if the other thing that you're writing is like terrible, it might just be like a nice outlet. So that's what I recommend is to have multiple things on the, on your mind while you're writing. Love that. Um, Madison asks, when do the new books come out? You know, that's a good question. I don't know. I probably should know. I think, uh, I don't, I, maybe I haven't been given an official date to be honest. I'm, uh, I'll let you know I'll, on social yeah. media. I'll put that yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, and then Anna asks to me from beginning to end, Gilda seemed to be very clearly autistic, her social awkwardness, intense empathy, constantly focusing on appearing as normal. Was this intentional? Um, I will say like, so I'm not a psychologist, so I'm hesitant to say, um, things like, like I'm confident in saying guilt is depressed and anxious because I'm, you know, pretty well-versed in that. I think she probably maybe is autistic and maybe OCD and things, but I don't want to say that necessarily because I'm not an expert. And, uh, I will say though, that I base Gilda part on like a handful of, of people, partly including some people who um, one of them definitely has OCD and uh, one of them is definitely uh, autistic. So I think it would be fair to read her that way, but I don't want to say like, you know, permanently for sure that she, that she is, cause I don't feel um, qualified to say that, but it's fair for you to, for you to read her that way. <laughs> yeah. Love that answer. 
Um, Hannah says, I know you mentioned it's going, it's going to be okay, baby by Muna as an inspiration for this book. What Muna song would you give your upcoming works? Oh, that's a good question. Um, side note, I saw Muna live and it changed me. <laughs> so <I> love them. <laughs> <laughs> They're so cool. Um, they, on their recent album, they had like, I can't, I'm terrible with song titles. Just a second. It's called, it might be called Shooting Star. Shooting Star, maybe. Um, yeah, it is. Yeah, I didn't have to look. Shooting Star. Is that for <laughs> um, the space one? Where the, for the space the one, yeah. The, the poem one is like, um, the poem book is a like queer retelling of biblical passages and catholic prayers so there's not um emily it's not a narrative <laughs> i'm so excited oh. <laughs> obsessed i'm gonna give it to my mom as a <laughs> uh. no she she's cool she's cool okay. um i love that Okay, and then Aaron says, the scene where Gilda's on the bridge and the two teenage boys drive up and check on her made me sob for an hour. I felt like it was the first time that someone really checked on her and it hurt me so much more that it was complete strangers. Was it supposed to read this way? I didn't want you to sob for hours, no, but <laughs> um, I was trying to show what it's like for, for other people to see you and and the and like what I was saying about Barney and... Uh, Giuseppe, I also wanted to show that there are people who, you know, are in tune to other people and do care and, and are, you know, paying attention. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, that was the last question, I think. Um, and we're almost at exactly an hour. Um, I love it when timing works out. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for chatting with me with our book club today. It was such a pleasure. Um, I had so much fun and I am so, so excited for your upcoming work. So please stay in touch with us. Thanks so much for having me. It was fun. And uh, this is such a cool book club. Um, I love that this exists. So good for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And everyone, let's go geek out on Geneva and talk about everything. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks for having me.